but mutation excess for a moment because there are many types of cross-site scripting in this world one of the more recent ones that has been discovered is mutation cross-site scripting and i think you should know about this because this is a course about cross-site scripting but i don't think you should be intimately familiar with it why is that guys this is fucking cool this is batshit crazy literally batshit crazy that this exists but mutation xss in reality a lot of the bug bounties that are found are basic basic cross-site script things and definitely not mutation now if you really want to hit some cool 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 ass shit this is this is where it's at for me basically you're transforming your code into something that it's not we are executing your code through some kind of like there there are some issues with the html parser and the dumps in your html if you assign things to a specific html tag template tag uh, there well we'll get more into it but when you feed it a broken attack vector it might fix it for you this happens due to some quirks in the html parser and how browsers interpret that why is that because when you and i open a website when a browser makes a when a browser developer makes a browser they have to interpret the rfc for web for basically HTML hypertext markup language. And that RFC is filled, filled, filled with ambiguities. That's also why some cross-site scripting attack vectors will work on some browsers, but not on others. Now, due to some weird quirks in how HTML parsing works in specific browsers, safe payloads will get altered into actual executions. The components at play here are the inner HTML component. If you don't know about that, Google JavaScript inner HTML. Basically, you're going to change the HTML of a tag, what is in it. So you can change it into anything at that point. That's what inner HTML is. The DOM is a document object model. That's a programming interface for HTML and XML documents. So if you make a website and you press previous, how does the website or the browser know what is the previous page that you visited? That's your document object model. Everything surrounding your website that is not code. And then you have the HTML sanitizer, which is going to ensure that HTML data does not contain harmful content and it's going to blacklist certain tags and sanitize the DOM tree. How does DOM Purify work in that regard? DOM Purify sanitizes user input by using template elements. The browser will process the inner HTML property of the div element and the same property of the template element differently. So imagine you have a div element, an HTML div element with an inner HTML property. If you have the same on a template, sanitization will happen before it tries to execute any javascript within it so basically what will happen is that diff will try to immediately execute that inner html after a value is assigned no sanitization there the template it will sanitize it in with dom purify user input gets put into the template inner html the browser is going to interpret it but not execute it and sanitize it but that logic is flawed now how does the browser interpret invalid html at the top there you'll see some invalid html and that'll be corrected into this so if we oops, sorry if we go back here you'll see div script or at least this is valid i should say here you see the invalid part but this is how the browser will interpret this right here. So you have a script titled div, it will do script uh, script title slash div, and it'll add your slash script here. That is basically trying to fix it. With this content right here, you can see the weird shit that's happening. So we have a script with a div title a script or the slash script, basically we end it ourselves. And then we have like a, as you can see here, double quote and a greater than sign. What happens is the browser tries to correct it, see that, oh, script, it's already written here, so what do I do? Script div title slash script, uh, fine, I don't need to sanitize any further. I'm gonna 
but what what do I do? Okay, here we have the slash head body, and I'm just gonna print whatever the fuck I want in there in terms of JavaScript. So that's pretty cool, isn't it? When it comes to HTML background or HTML parsing, I am not going to no 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 it's like a massive rfc i'm not going to go too deep into that but sonar cube what they've done is they developed a nice sheet sheet and they've gone over the different parsing types so html html hypertext markup language you enter some text and the browser needs to make something of it that's called the parsing there are void elements there are template elements raw text elements escapable raw text elements, foreign content elements, plain text states, and normal elements. Now, what do they mean by that? Void elements are things that you don't put anything within. So an area, base, a break rule. Basically, a break rule is an enter. You don't put break rule text slash break rule. That's a void element. Parsing happens differently than with a template element or a raw text element, a script. You're gonna put text in there, aren't you? So that's a raw text mm -hmm. element, an iframe, a no frame, and no script. Same for the escapable raw text element, foreign content element, the SVG, the MOV, plain text state, etc., etc. All of these different elements are interpreted differently. So what are the conditions for a successful mutation cross-site scripting attack vector? The chances increase based on the behavior of different HTML parsers, depending on the browsers, aka the presence and the positioning of backticks within the payload and the use of JavaScript libraries and HTML sanitizers. As you can see below, this is a fucking massively cool payload that gets sanitized into something that actually pops. So this comes from a real bug bounty example great example i'll make sure to put that link as well somewhere in the notes of this lesson but this is a great example of a very complex attack vector where you have foreign content elements with the mouth you have style elements if you remember correctly right here you can see that's a raw text element different parsing and an image which is with another void element again different parsing and on top of that you also have some bypasses here, and percent greater than and percent less than your HTML encodings. You, it's it's fucking great. It's it's an art. You guys may stare at a painting and think, oh, that's fucking artwork. I love it. I stare at attack vectors all day, and I'm, oh, that's amazing. I love it. It's beautiful. Oh, can I give it a kiss? <laughs> love it. <laughs> so those partial differentials. You can see that a mutation like this, where JavaScript is disabled, the no script, basically a no script section. You have a style here with the text having a slash no script right there. And you see image source equals X, on error equals alert. If you don't have JavaScript enabled, that's what you'll see. If you do have it enabled, below is what you'll see, the actual alert. Why is that? Because that slash no script is actually interpreted uh, as an end of the script, basically. That's what that is, but it doesn't print it out. And then your image does get printed out. Your script can just run. So beautiful, so beautiful. So um, I'm not gonna go over parsing round trips. That's a little bit too deep. I am gonna remove that slide. But when it comes to desanitization, that's basically a crucial mistake made by the applications when their sanitizers are going to capture the output, sanitize, and then send it to a browser. If there's any small change in that markup, the final DOM tree could have massive impacts on it. I'm talking about the document object model. I'm not talking about the HTML mod, the HTML tree. I'm talking about literally the DOM tree. So anything around that HTML, how that tree is set up, will depend massively on how the markup is. That's, of course, logical. With this, depending on how we craft our tag vectors, we can bypass sanitizations. There are a few articles that I've put here, pitfalls of desanitization, leaking customer data from an OS ticket, 
code vulnerabilities put Proton mails at the risk, remote code execution and tutor node desktop due to code flow, and code vulnerabilities put skiff email at risk. Here are also a few case studies with one from SonarCube, a reply to calc, oh, sorry about that, reply to calc and the attack chain to compromise mail spring, and there's a CVE included for your convenience and leisure. Thank you very much. I really appreciate it. And I think we should move on to the next topic.